The Passover is one of the most well-known events in the Bible. During the enslavement of the Israelites in Egypt, a set of plagues is set against the Egyptians. The final plague is the killing of every firstborn son. In order to escape this fate, the Israelites are told to put lamb's blood on their doorposts. This way, the angel that was sent would pass over the homes of the Israelites. The Passover celebration has a long history, and in today's video, we will cover the evolution of this holiday. We will not be concentrating too much on the origins of the holiday, as that subject is still shrouded in some mystery, but the development of the rituals involved in the holiday celebration are the main focus of this video. After it had already been celebrated, how did the customs change over time and location? Most importantly, why did the customs change? Today, we will be exploring the history of Passover. <laughs> The origins of Passover are shrouded in mystery. The Hebrew word for Passover is Pesach. The term must have existed before the Exodus narrative, as there is no clarification of what it means, and the people seem to know what is being ordered. Therefore, Exodus cannot be the origin for it. The translation Passover is based on the Latin Vulgate, but the term Pesach has been understood in a variety of ways, even among ancient manuscripts and rabbinical traditions. This includes to protect, and to have compassion. Because the lamb is introduced as a Passover, Pesach, offering to the Lord, the translation Passover is the least likely of the three, although it does well as a vivid description of the biblical narrative. Although the modern Passover celebration lasts a whole week, it would have originally been separate from the Feast of Unleavened Bread, a bread usually called matzah, which is still eaten at every Passover. Often in the Old Testament, the two celebrations are noted together, but are kept distinct. For example, in Leviticus 23, 5-6. The Lord's Passover begins at twilight, on the 14th day of the first month. On the 15th day of that month, the Lord's festival of unleavened bread begins. For seven days, you must eat bread made without yeast. This distinction is further made in Ezra 6:19 through 22 on the 14th day of the first month, the exiles celebrated the Passover. The priests and Levites had purified themselves and were all ceremonially clean. The Levites slaughtered the Passover lamb for all the exiles, for their relatives, the priests, and for themselves. So the Israelites who had returned from the exile ate it, together with all who had separated themselves from the unclean practices of their Gentile neighbors in order to seek the Lord, the God of Israel. For seven days they celebrated with joy the festival of unleavened bread, because the Lord had filled them with joy by changing the attitude of the king of Assyria so that he assisted them in the work on the house of God, the God of Israel. While the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Feast of the Paschal Sacrifice were originally separate, they would come to be celebrated as one. Further support adding to the idea that the two festivals were initially separate can be found in the so-called Passover Papyrus from Elephantine in Egypt. In the 5th century BCE, a group of Diaspora Judeans were stationed in the area after the Persians had defeated the Babylonians. This wasn't uncommon. After the return from exile, many of the people stayed out of Israel they formed communities in many places in the Persian Empire. One of these was located in Elephantine in Upper Egypt. We have discovered an Aramaic papyri cache from the community there, and the Passover papyrus was one of these texts. Although fragmentary, the text is as follows. Now you thus count 14 days of Nisan, and from the 15th until the 21st day of Nisan, be pure and take heed. Any work, do not do. Do not drink. Anything of leaven, do not eat. Sunset until the 21st day of Nisan. Bring the leaven into your chambers and seal it up during these days. The text, nor any other part of the extant papyri, make any reference to the Law of Moses or the Exodus. The Passover papyrus is one such text and more likely describes the festival of unleavened bread. Although it is likely that the group celebrated Passover, the extant texts make no reference to a biblical origin for these holidays, and even calls up the authority of the king instead of Moses in the observance of this holiday. By the time of the Christian era, the two festivals were one. A very early and famous Passover narrative comes from the New Testament in the form of Jesus' Last Supper. In the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus and his disciples are celebrating Passover. 
However, in the case of John's Gospel, Jesus dies the day before Passover, hence making Jesus himself the Passover lamb. The Passover celebrations of the first century would soon become the Passover Seder, the celebratory meal. Seder is a Hebrew term meaning order. Paul himself even draws a connection between Jesus and the Passover sacrifice when he says in 1 Corinthians 5-7, Get rid of the old yeast, so that you may be a new unleavened batch as you really are, for Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. For Christians, this Passover sacrifice became a sin offering, as was common in ancient Israel. However, it's clear that the Passover lamb was not a sin offering, but an offering for protection. This is especially seen from the writings of Josephus and Philo, two prominent Jewish figures of the time. Josephus, in his description of the Passover celebration, makes no reference to sin or blood. Often, the blood of the lamb is cited in the New Testament as a means of removing sin. Instead, Josephus just references the holiday as a celebration and a remembrance to be observed with others. Furthermore, Philo takes an allegorical meaning from the Passover and comments that the Passover is when the soul is anxious to unlearn its subjection to irrational passions and willingly submits itself to a reasonable mastery over them. Let's take a brief detour to introduce the next section of the video. The most important book in any Passover today is the Passover Haggadah. This is a liturgical text used for the celebration that was created for the use of passing down the tradition from parents to children. This is based on a dictation by Moses in Exodus 13.8. On that day, tell your son, I do this because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. The Haggadah includes instructions on how to celebrate, when to celebrate, and why to celebrate the holiday. There are many versions of this text. As it is not a holy text, additions and changes can be made as the setting for the people changes. If they are unable to perform a certain part of the Passover the way that it had traditionally been done, the liturgy can be changed to accommodate the people. After the destruction of the temple in 70 CE by the Romans, the Passover celebration began to change. There was no centralized place for the celebration, so the Passover Seder had to be moved to the homes of individual families. Already, the Passover was shifting from one phase of its life to the next. This was before any standardized Haggadah text, so the people would celebrate Passover differently depending on their time and place. To begin this journey of the Haggadah, we must consider the small changes in the holiday before an actual Haggadah came to be. There are over 5,000 versions of the Haggadah. Why is this? There are three main reasons. Geography and language that comes with that, diversity in Jewish practices, and history. Geography and language play a role for major translations since there is no such thing as a perfect translation, and this would entail that the understanding of Haggadah, and therefore the Passover, are at least slightly different. Diversity in Jewish practice takes on a major role when considering the many sects of the faith such as Reform Judaism, Orthodox Judaism, Conservative Judaism, and others. History plays a part as well, since new challenges offer an opportunity for reinterpretation and a revitalization of the community. The four major ancient texts that should be discussed are the Mishnah, the Talmud, the Tosefta, and the Midrash. The Mishnah is meant to be a codification of the oral law that was passed down, but not written, in the holy texts themselves. If there was something unclear, the Mishnah was meant to explain it. The Tosefta contained more supplementary teaching. The Midrash can be viewed as a rabbinical commentary that is mostly concentrated on ritual and sermonic practices. Finally, the Talmud, both the Jerusalem Talmud and the Babylonian Talmud, contained debates from rabbis on topics related to a plethora of texts and traditions. These were written in the 5th and 6th centuries CE. Firstly, the Tosefta describes a Passover that is much shorter than the one found in the Mishnah. It includes a blessing over wine, a reading of psalms, a collection of sweetbreads, matzah, as is customary, and the meal. If there were certain words to be said during the meal, the Tosefta does not tell us what they are. The celebration is closed off by a lengthy study of the Torah until dawn. The Mishnah contains a more detailed Passover, and seems to be less fun, in a sense. It contains step-by-step -step instructions for wine pouring, 
hand washing, and food preparation. Among other things, it even contains some scripted discussions of the Torah and God. One of the many questions it seeks to answer is when the Torah reading is supposed to be. In the Tosefta, Torah study was for the very end, when the men had already had plenty of wine. The Mishnah says the study should be before the meal. The Talmud, containing debates on a wide range of subjects, covers questions like, how many cups of wine should you drink? How should the Passover story be told? And is Cheraset, a sweet paste made of fruits and nuts, a mitzvah, commandment? For the first question, on the number of cups of wine, the Mishnah was clear that it should be four. But the Talmud records at least one rabbi who thought it should be five, as the idea of doing things in pairs was seen as unlucky. Further, on the question of how the Passover story should be told, one rabbi thought that the telling should concentrate on the transition from ancestors worshipping idols to the freedom of worshipping Yahweh alone. On the other hand, another rabbi thought that the story should be told by focusing on the transition of the lowly state of the Israelites as slaves to their divine liberation. The Haggadah found a way to integrate both these understandings. Finally, the debate on Cheraset being a commandment was mostly debated on the grounds of Mishnah and Torah. However, it was settled by the simple fact that it was very popular in the community. Because of this, eating Cheraset at Passover is considered a mitzvah. One of the most interesting traditions to come out of the Midrash is the asking of four questions by sons. The smartest son would ask a very complex question, and the not-so-smart son would ask the simplest. The Midrash claims that because the command to pass the story to your children appears four times, the Midrash imagines these four sons to ask about the meaning of Passover. The tradition continues today, and Haggadahs even claim that these four sons are biblical, even though that is obviously not the case to anyone who has read the Bible. Some of the earliest Haggadah texts are to be found in the Cairo Geniza, a cache of manuscripts discovered in a storeroom of a synagogue in Cairo. While the texts span about a millennium, some of them note prayers that were specifically for Passover. They were not freestanding Haggadahs, but they came from prayer books composing the entire year's liturgy. While the first complete Haggadahs would only come about in the 13th century, the rabbis were fighting over the authoritative position of their Passover understanding. This was because of the obligation to tell the story to your children. In the 9th century, one rabbi, Rabbi Natranai defended the Babylonian Haggadah traditions over those of Israel. This tradition became very popular, and many of the Jewish people based their own practices on it, and even modified some of them based on their needs and specific beliefs. The development would proceed further in the 12th century, when one of the most important figures in Jewish history, Maimonides, wrote his Mishneh Torah. In order to clarify every single commandment and answer practical questions about them, he also introduced his own Haggadah text. Mishnah Torah included questions such as, what counts as bitter herb? Why does Moses seem less prevalent in the Haggadah? And many more. The Haggadah, as an evolving text of traditions and rituals, was largely set by the 19th century, although more variations and novelty Haggadahs continued to be published, such as children's versions and feminist versions. New versions are often published during times of strife as well, such as after the atrocities of World War II. Today, on the Hebrew calendar, Passover is celebrated from the 15th of Nisan through the 21st of Nisan. Sometimes it ends on the 22nd of that month if you're part of the diaspora community. This usually falls sometime between the end of March and the end of April on the Gregorian calendar. For example, in 2021, Passover was from the 27th of March to the 8th of April. In 2022, Passover will be celebrated from the 15th of April to the 23rd of April. Aside from the date, what does the Passover Seder tend to look like today? As discussed above, factors like geography and diversity play a role in the differences between celebrations, but here are the common themes. It begins with a blessing of wine, and the people wash their hands. A variety of veggies are dipped into salt water. Matzah is broken in two, and half, the afikamen, is hidden. There is a retelling of the Exodus, and a discussion of how to remember it. There is the famous set of four questions that children should ask, and this is followed by the eating of matzah, 
something bitter, and more hand washing. This is followed by the dinner, which contains many foods that are symbolic of the Exodus. There is a search for the Afikamen, and the dinner is ended with grace and Hillel songs. Torah study usually follows. While these are the basic practices, there are some traditions that add more practices. One of my favorites in the celebration of Passover is the Persian tradition of hitting each other with scallions during the singing of the song Dayenu to recall the Egyptian beating of the Israelites with whips. It is clear from this brief history that Passover and the Haggadah have changed over time for a variety of reasons. In summary, the tradition changes when it needs to in order to follow the law of Moses. Passover has long and storied history, and its malleability means that Passover will continue to be celebrated and change for years to come. Thanks for watching. If you haven't yet, be sure to like and subscribe. If you enjoy our content and want to help support this channel, check out our Patreon and Teespring links in the description. If you don't want to spend money but still see what we're doing outside of YouTube, make sure to follow us on Facebook and Twitter. We'll see you next time.